Welcome to the Take 92 Podcast. My name is Sammy Warmhands. I am your host. And today I am excited to welcome back to the show for a second time from Useless ID, Yotam Ben Horan. Now, last time we talked all about his career in the grand scheme of things and the arc of Useless ID, but today we just get to dive all in on his new album, Young Forever. This is his solo stuff. It is absolutely fantastic. This is Yotam Ben Horan. Yo. How's it going, man? Good. How are you? Great. We got the uh, intercontinental time zones figured out again. Yeah. <laughs> well, congrats on this new album, Young Forever, the new solo album on Double Helix Records. When Thank you. When we last spoke, you were on the podcast a couple years back, and you said you hadn't written a new song in six months. I wonder, was this born of all the many live stream shows that you did, or like how did these songs come out of kind of a dry spell? Most of them kind of existed before that. Okay. I had like a few, like a handful of songs for like a possible uh, next Tommy and June album. Yeah. I didn't really plan on making a solo album. So I had that. I had like another song that was kind of like meant for a different project. I think it was September 2020, I decided that I'm going to try to write a useless ID album just in the middle of all the madness. Yeah. Like, all right, I have like a bunch of songs on the side. So I, I started to write like a bunch of like more punk songs. And then the song Young Forever came in that session. And I was like, oh, this is more like a storytelling type of thing. So maybe I'll keep it for this other thing that I might do. Yeah. I was already doing the like the Facebook lives for a while. So I was already making promises that... Once I get my ass over to the U.S., I'm going to record an album for all the people that donated and tipped throughout this uh, weird time, and that would be my thank you. So that's kind of what led to me making another solo album. Well, let me ask you this, because I had read, I think, on Brooklyn Vegan, and maybe I got the song wrong, but I thought that Young Forever was like the last song for this record and that it kind of came towards the end. Exactly. That's what it was. The other songs existed already. Oh, okay. Okay. Like, now that I'm thinking about it, some of the songs were written for the first Tommy and June. I, I just had like, I don't know, 25 songs for that. Oh, wow. And, uh, we chose only 10. And I'm like, wow, but I like these other eight or whatever. So, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I just kept them on the side and I, I let the songs, as we say, I let them live for a bit and like exist. And yeah. I started playing them uh, like in the Facebook live. You know, I just still had a connection with them. And then after that, Tommy and June, I started writing like the next Tommy and June. So it kind of came out of the Tommy and June experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At a certain point, it just starts accumulating. You're like, I got to get all these things out. You know, they're, they're yeah. worthy of being heard, even though they didn't make sense on that particular project. Yeah, exactly. But it's, it's good that it pushed me uh, to, to write all those songs. But yeah, I was going through a dry spell. It, Dude, it's still a bit hard for me. Well, now I'm like traveling a lot and all these things are happening in my personal life, you know, like the getting married. Yeah, congratulations, man. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm stoked. I'm stoked on all these like different uh, experiences in life. So I, I, I really need some quiet in order to like get back to writing because I, I, I write the best when it's just like dead quiet and I don't have like any worries looming over my head. Yeah. Well, I, I think yeah. it's good that you've had so much to digest in your life that's different because, you know, you and I are both prolific writers. We crank out a lot of songs, but yeah. it's always great when you do have a break and you've lived some shit that you are coming back with a fresh perspective next time. Yeah, exactly. I, I feel kind of re-energized because for the longest time I've been listening to podcasts and kind of like avoided listening to music. Yeah. I like, wow, I barely listen to music these days. I'm just listening to like old punk rockers talk about the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> I really just got back to listening to punk rock now. I'm just like putting on records and just getting in that groove. And that that's what kind of like stimulates me to like, ah, I, I want to write a song now. So, yeah. So yeah. Getting Same back here. In that. Well, last time you were on, we kind of went through your whole backstory. And so if anybody wants to hear that, I believe it was episode 82. And you can go back and check that out. But now we have the luxury of just talking about the new record. So I kind of made notes on each song and I uh, thought we could, we could just do a deep dive if that's cool with you. Cool. Let's go, man. All right. So it opens with Back to the Start, just a beautiful 
quiet finger style acoustic song. I think I texted you like right away yeah. first time I heard it, like, oh my God, this could have come straight off Revolver, you know, like this is yeah. <laughs> this is one of my very favorite songs on the whole record. And this is already wow. like probably, uh, yeah, my favorite solo record of yours now that I have the last three. So tell me where this song came from, first of all. And um, then I have a question about a part of it. This song was meant to be for like the next Tommy and June because we finished the first one and we were talking about like following up right away with another record, like not waiting two years, just yeah. like releasing this and like a half a year later releasing another one. I was just on fire and this was like uh, around January 2019. So I had that song and we demoed it with Johnny from uh, Old Man Markley and we had that song as a demo. And I remember letting Fat Mike hear it and he's like, oh, I really love this song. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's like another level up with your songwriting because it's like super Beatlesy, and I'm also playing these descending thing that mm -hmm. happens in a lot of Beatles songs and also no effects songs. <laughs> but I'm going to these like weird chords as well and weird shapes on the guitar and I just kind of went with it. And there's another little thing with that song, but I'll tell you this uh, funny thing right after you uh, asked me what you wanted to. So my question <laughs> is, if the song was around for a minute, there's a very interesting change up just at the outro where you do this slow down to kind of segue out of the song. And I wondered, was that something always there or was that something that you came up with while you were in production on the record? Because I thought you do little songwriting tricks a lot where you'd be listening and you think you know what to expect. And then there's just, oh, that's a little tasty thing. Oh, that's a little tasty thing. And so, yeah, I wondered when that little outro came about. When I wrote the song. All I right. Just, uh, the way you hear it, that's how I wrote it. And for a while, the song had a double chorus, and that's where, where, where I wanted to go with this. The song had another chorus, and uh, I recorded it that way, like with the second chorus, same lyrics, like, you know, coming up again. We already had a test pressing and almost into pressing the vinyl itself. I just woke up one morning, and I'm like, no, it's not right. It needs to be one chorus, and it needs to be short, like a Beatles song. Yeah. <laughs> so I got in touch with the label. They totally understood. They're like, all right, we'll do it. The fine people at Double Helix Records, if I can mention them. Yeah, shout super out. Super supportive and super awesome. So that little bit was there from the start because I like going weird places yeah. um, with songwriting. And I guess I was like really in that sort of like Beatles headspace. I, I, I was like, okay, so how would the Beatles end this song? And I, I you know, it's totally. Da -da 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 yep, yep. <laughs> now, yeah. Coming out of this is a huge curveball. I had read in an interview that you said you, you like a first track that's sort of like a quiet way to get your attention and then really kick off after that. We have in between the highs and lows, and we start with a full band. We've got trumpets just packed <laughs> with energy, you know, great melodies. And I love that the second song is such a big surprise like that. Like, oh, no, this is a rock record, too. I knew going into the studio that I wanted that to be the sequence between those two songs. Like that song ends and then it, it starts. Actually, a lot of the production is uh, Bob Hogue. Yeah. I had like an idea, but he came up with the drum part. And then we kind of like kept playing off each other. And I also knew that I wanted trumpet because I never have trumpet in my songs. And I've been listening to uh, this Joe Strummer solo album and I've been rediscovering Oingo Boingo. So I was like, ah, why, why not go all out world music with this one? Because I'm also singing a weird thing in the chorus. <laughs> yeah, well, I was, I was going to ask about that. Like, how do you decide on, you have a pop rock singer songwriter vibe throughout the record. And then the only song that has horns on it, the only song that has another language in the chorus, you know, you're singing <laughs> Amo Estevoy. How did you arrive at this being the single that you shoot a whole video for? It's actually the second single. Yeah, yeah. But the other one is like found footage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I felt that there was something uh, really special with this one. And also, uh, even when the album was just mixed, I sent it over to Frank Turner. Cause yeah. I, I do that sometimes. I send him over my new albums. And he got back to me with uh, In Between the Highs and Lows is great. Nice. And, you know, that's the song that he really liked. And, I, and then someone else also told me, wow, this song is special. And I think that's what you strive for as long as I've been doing this. 
you you always want to like recreate something in your music and uh, i don't think i've ever sung in, in like two languages in one song yeah and had this horns and uh had this type of like uh pixies type count where it's like not like a, a four count it's yeah like kind of like breaks in the middle and so yeah all all those elements together produced this uh song that i was like this has to be the song we push out yeah and i love the video too it just ties in with the album artwork and especially the timing of the release like it's kind of a a summer track and uh i had to ask about just kind of how it got picked because i remember the first time i watched it i commented on your facebook like am i hearing you wrong like what are you saying and you're like no no it's it's actually in another language okay okay got it <laughs> yeah when i first got the mixes i was at chuck's house from good riddance so we listened together so he's like what are you singing i'm a western boy yeah <laughs> that's awesome uh next we have the title track young forever which starts immediately we're just dropped right into the verse you know we gradually pick up the layers the instrumentation this song is sort of hopeful and melancholy at the same time it's almost like shades of symptoms from useless id meets like yeah. some almost 80s pop or something or like 80s new wave kind of thing going on um we briefly talked about this but i i read that there was a, a cameo on this one that i wasn't aware of yeah i played a show with jim like six years ago in israel from jimmy Eat world I, I, yeah J jim atkins from jimmy Eat world but I've actually known him in a way forever because uh, in the first Useless ID tour, we followed Jimmy World on a few of their dates and we kind of like became friendly. So I, I would see him every few years. I would either go see a show, but we didn't keep in touch. But in Israel, we kind of like sort of connected. And he said, uh, and I took him out like to eat somewhere. So he's like, man, if you're ever in a Mexican restaurant. So every time I would come to Arizona, I would say, are we doing Mexican food? And he's like, nah, I'm on tour. I'm on tour. Yeah. And this time, it was like, you know, kind of still inside like the COVID world. So I was like, hey, man, I'm in town. I'm actually recording. Would like to see you. We could get food. He's like, I want to come down and say hi. So it kind of like uh, snowballed from that whole thing. So I was I started thinking, well, if he's coming down to say hi, maybe I could send him a song real quick and yeah. see what he thinks about it. So I sent him like this demo of Young Forever where it wasn't arranged the way it is. And then he got back to me. He's like, I think you should make a third chorus. I think you should leave. A, and, you know, I'm writing all these things down. I'm yeah. like, I'm going to have him arrange this song without him knowing. <laughs> <laughs> so we did that. And then by the time he came to the studio, we had the whole song done. And Bob and I decided to just leave this middle section kind of like empty yeah. and see if, if he wants to do something. And he said, yeah, you should probably play like a guitar solo on it, you know, in the studio. And then I'm like do you want to play a guitar solo on it? And he's like, uh, okay, well, what do you want me to play? And I'm like, whatever comes to your mind, you yeah. play. And then he, he played the solo on like the lowest strings. And I'm like, great, we got it. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I would never play on the bass strings, but that's his style. And I, I love the way it sounds. That's awesome. Yeah, I had no idea until I was just taking my notes, reading up on what I might have missed. Here with me, strips back down to acoustic so we sort of have this vacillating like push and pull throughout the record you know we're going from acoustic to the, the full band and this is a very quiet reflection very mccartney again and it has a little synth part going on that reminds me a little bit of john frusciante I know who he is, yeah. Chili Peppers, but I, I never listened to his solo stuff, so uh, maybe I should. I'll have to send you something, because there's a couple moments on this record, and I'll, I'll point out another one later, that have similar sensibilities to, especially his like sonic palette. But yeah, another really beautiful song, almost a sister song to uh, the first track. Leopard is where I feel like we really get a feel for the album. Like, there are two sets of songs as i kind of mentioned yeah. i imagine that was such a hard thing to sequence but it, it strikes a great balance and and this one is is sort of young forever highs and lows back on that yeah, energy yeah. right but while the production is still nice and big it's not just a rock song it's not quite as anthemic because i think there's 
a sweetness in your delivery, like your vocals have a softness to it that makes it so it's not like a huge dynamic shift, even though the instrumentation is different. Like, does that make sense? Yeah, totally. It's pretty much uh, straight all the way through. <laughs> and the chords kind of stay the same as well. Just uh, to mention, that's actually a song that I intentionally wrote for Joan Jett. Oh. Because uh, when I was working with Fat Mike, I, I was in Thailand. This was like right before COVID. He, he sent me an email. He's like, Joan Jett is looking for songs for her possible next album. Cool. Write a few. So Leopard was one of the songs I wrote. At, at the end, nothing happened with Joan Jett. But uh, that was my favorite song from the batch I wrote. Yeah. So I was like, I should record my favorite song. for, And that was like also a minute and a half long. So at the studio, we kind of like worked on it. And then uh, Ishai from Useless ID helped me with the chorus because I was stuck. Like the chorus was a bit different. So he came up with the, don't go, just stay with me. Don't go, just stay with me. We'll the world. The just stay with me. I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's like total like Morrissey style. So my whole uh, vibe with that song is... You know, kind of like uh, Lemonheads, Replacements. I tried to kind of channel that type of thing. Yeah, it's got a bit of a 90s vibe to it. I like what you said, though, about Ishe adding that bit into the hook because we had Brenna Red on the show, as you know. We shouted yeah. you out on that episode. But I remember her saying in a different interview, not only did you work on, uh, I think it was Shameless and, and some other stuff, but you had a note on noise 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 like in the chorus of like oh you know what you're doing the same line again but if you add this little thing to it she's like and he yes. totally made the chorus and now Ishe does the same thing for you like sometimes you just need yeah, that yeah. Sometimes, that outside sometimes ear you need a fellow songwriter that's not in, inside the loop to kind of like give his two cents on it yeah and uh, i trust Ishai because uh, we've been in a band forever and he knows me as a songwriter so he knows kind of like where to take me out of like my uh personal zone and what do you think about this you know or like because he musically he's he's different than me you know? yeah yeah he, he writes in a completely different way so i'm glad i hit him up <laughs> yeah i love it, that it made the song better the next song i mean this as a a compliment we've talked before about tony sly and santa okay. monica pier is very tony sly to me uh, there's even this little like modulation in the chorus Say you wouldn't mind on the loneliest ride down I love that we talked about you going uh, I think it was on Warp Tour and you guys would workshop songs together every day yeah. and we sang that cover uh, on my Stolen yeah. Songs 4 record as a tribute do you ever uh, catch those bits in your in yourself too of like you knew that one was kind of Beatlesy. do you ever hear those moments that are oh you know that's got a little tony on it that's cool uh well with the title there's you know he has the shortest pier mm -hmm. but i didn't really think about that because i just experienced this whole thing at santa monica pier that was life-changing and mind-blowing and like took me out of that that world i was in living at fat mike's yeah. You know, my relationship was falling apart during that time and uh, Useless ID also was not doing much. So I was like, oh, yeah, I, I got to get back to my stuff, you know. So that was a whole little experience that I experienced with uh, Paula, who was then my girlfriend and now she's my wife. I had the music. I wrote the music next to the bunk bed when I was living at Fat Mike's. <laughs> I wrote it one night and I was like, that little melody thing is good. I, I should put some words to it when I get the chance. And yeah, once I got to it, Israel before... Uh, the tour we did in Japan with Useless ID. So I worked on the lyrics and it, it all came like together with that whole Santa Monica experience. But with the Tony, uh, here's a little thing in the chorus, like I think the harmony is very close to his vocal melody. And that's okay. And then I'm that is oh, yeah, shortest short, peer. Yeah, shortest peer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I'm singing on the, the backing vocal is a uh, stay. You wouldn't mind. On the loneliest ride. So it's it's the same notes. And I was telling Bob, the producer, I think I'm going to get shit for this. Because this <laughs> song already kind of like reminiscent of Tony. So to kind of like pull his vocal melody and make it like a harmony. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you're not the first one to say that there's a Tony influence on that song. But I like to take it as a compliment because 
when the Tony influence shows up, I kind of like embrace it. I'm not like, I don't want to sound like no use or I don't want to sound like Tony. It's, it's a part of the thing. Well, yeah, I think it's neat. I mean, I was friends with a rapper named Idea who passed away very young. And a lot of us on his little label, Crush Kill, we tried to keep that alive in a way. And, you know, so you would hear little references and and stylistic elements that were you know in line with what he did when he was alive and um yeah i don't know i think it's it's neat that you can still hear bits obviously you still hear those kind of things in mike's writing you know in no effect songs you'll hear a little no use here and there and um of course you know i think that's really cool at the end of the day that's part of it that's part of the art and it's inspiration i mean how can you do without it you know yeah uh so next we have boy with glasses which is a very personal song. If you need to put up a limit on what you want to say on this one, I get that. It has sort of a 6-8 feel with uh, guitar and piano. And this was another Frusciante parallel that I was going to point out because it, it reminds me a bit of a song from his acoustic album, Curtains, called Leap Your Bar. You know, from the lyrics of this song, it's obviously about losing someone very close to you. But there's a nice, like, reminiscence of the times you had as opposed to dwelling on the loss. You know what I'm saying? Well, uh, I'll try to make it short. But this is uh, this song is about my first friend I had when my family moved to Israel. Yeah. And I was a complete outsider and introvert. And uh, I, we arrived in the summer of 93. And then I had to start school. And I don't know anyone. It's about the kid that came up to me and he said, hey, we should be friends. I like, you know, I have a few other friends here and you should come with us to the Boy Scouts. And through him, I discovered uh, the Pixies because uh, I was looking for bands that sounded like Nirvana because I, I was into that at the time. But I, I wasn't into the whole like, you know, the Alice in Chains. It, it, I mean, it's fine, but I, I was looking for something else. And when I discovered the Pixies, I accidentally threw him because I was shy to ask the people that were listening to it what they were listening to. He's like, he, so he went and did it. So, yeah, so he was my friend it, during that year. And then I switched to a different school and I haven't kept in touch with him all of those years. And uh, a few years ago, I looked him up on Facebook yeah. and I found this. Uh, I found like this one photo of him and his daughter, like him as a man now. And uh, so I looked up, like, if anyone wrote, or because there was nothing on his page. And then I found this, like, giant essay about him that his best friend wrote, which turned out to be a eulogy. And it, it wrote that, it said that he passed away. Wow. Like, how, could he, how could he die at the age of 37? So my heart just fell to the floor, and I, I went into the other room, and I, I wrote this song in, like, 10 minutes. Wow. It just came out of me. It's like one of those. And if I would have to, like, analyze it musically or, like, as far as influence, I think it's kind of like more in the John K. Sampson, Weaker Thans. Normally, I don't have these type of like, you know, spoken word slash poetry lyrics on top of like background music. You yeah. know, my songs are like very melody based, but this is kind of like uh, a little story on top of background music. That's what I think. Yeah, it's definitely much more about the lyric in this song. Um, exactly. I love those musical references that you put in the verses because it's like, I was thinking about this recently and just when we start getting into this music as kids, you don't really know like where it comes from. You know, like some of the oldest punk CDs I have are ones where I'm at my friend's house. We're listening to this. I'm like, this is amazing. And then every time I come over, I'm like, oh, can we listen to that one again? And at a certain point, it's like, my first Pennywise CDs and my first No Effects CD, like all of those came from my friend's house because we would just trade. I'd find something I was obsessed with and you you don't really know anything because you're in fifth grade or something. And so I love hearing that stuff about him going, yeah, this is the Pixies. That's the thing with this one. Like he came over my house with two of his friends. I'm kind of like the new kid and they're hanging out in my room. And then when they left, I realized that my Nirvana bleach was missing. <laughs> and I, I think the other one that was missing was Stone Temple Pilots. Yeah. And so I put that in the lyric and I'm like, I don't like his Stone Temple Pilots. And so I'm like, let's put Mother Love Bone. Like, like let's make it comp complete Seattle. So I, I don't think they stole Mother Love Bone, but Nirvana Bleach for sure. <laughs> and I told the teacher about it. So like two days later, one of the other kids, not him, came to me with his head down and, <laughs> and gave me the CDs back, you know. <laughs> yeah. 
So, yeah, all that stuff happened. That's funny about having to get yours back. I remember one time I had loaned away my my dead Kennedy's plastic surgery disasters to a friend in the school band class. He came up to me one day and, and he was like, hey, man, so uh, I lost it. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, I don't know what happened. All I have is the booklet. And he gives me back the booklet. I was like, what the fuck, man? You got to buy me another one. And he gave it to me. I was like, what is this manifesto record? This is a weird reissue. Like, now it's gone. I don't know what happened. Yeah, I I have a good one for you. So uh, that same year, I lent another kid the original cassette of Body Count with Cop Killer before they... Yeah. uh, Yeah, Cop Killer was on it, and he never gave it back to me. Oh, man. (laughs) I looked for years and I finally found beginning of this year or end of last year, I finally found a uh, original pressing of that CD with the full original track list on there. Cop killer was banned, right? Yep. Yep. Um, on all the, all the reissues, but that's just, just cool to have. Not like, like it's an important song more than it's a great song, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like you got to have the real thing or like when, um, offspring reissued their first album they cut kill the president which was the closing song on the record Mm. i'm like why the fuck and like to this day you can't find it anywhere and i was like should i just upload this to my youtube so people like can hear it like it's not even there and then i thought well i don't want to get banned (laughs) on my channel or you know the secret service come knock at my door or something so maybe maybe it's a politically uh different time than 1989 when that song was written yep all right random tangent aside uh (laughs) pessimistic heart is a great pick me up after that really heavy story it's almost ironically upbeat because you know pessimistic heart being the the title and kind of what you're talking about but i think that's kind of like exactly the opposite of boy with glasses because if boy with glasses was all about the lyrics yeah i think this one is like pretty much all about like the melody and the uplifting vibe of the song it is because when you read the lyrics i didn't realize till today that you're saying fuck off in the chorus i like it rolls off the tongue so smooth there's no angst in it or anything like wait this song's way darker than i thought (laughs) uh yeah yeah you don't really pay attention to the darkness with this music you know it's kind of like they uh cross over each other yeah you know i love a band like real big fish or something where they'll intentionally juxtapose happy music with really bitter lyrics this one is just sort of a, a perfect medley it kind of just slips it under the rug like it you did you just didn't know yeah. it until you hear it a few more times I'm like oh shit i did not realize that's what he was saying um, <laughs> well and then after this just speaking of these these waves that we go on it dips down again into almost a lo-fi sort of vibe with go and I like that in the context of a very bright, shiny album. Like Bob Hogue's production is fantastic, and it's it's really clean, it's really slick, and this one has a little bit of a darker quality. It's got the Beatles-y cello thing going on. Yeah. Um, I wonder, was this ever considered as an opener or a closer? Because it's short enough to be an interlude or an outro or something. Yes, exactly. I was considering this one for the opener of the album. Okay. Until, uh, you know, I'm friends with Chris Rowe from the Ataris, and he likes the mm-hmm. songs in their raw forms as well. So I send him demos every time, like, I'm working on something or if I'm working on an album. So when I send him the batch of these demos, he was the one that pointed out, I don't think Go should open the album. Uh, Back to the Start should be the opener. Yeah. So, so yeah. So once he told me Back to the Start should be the opener, I kind of, like, got used to that being the opener, and then I built up on that. But he was the one that pointed it out. I originally intended for Go to open. I could totally hear it, but you know, props to Chris Rowe because again, that first song just like melts your heart. So I think that was the right move. But this could have easily been the opening track. The closing song, Across the Sea, this is great. This is like it could only be the last song because it yeah. almost has three acts. Like it's the most ambitious song because it starts beautifully again this reminds me a little bit of of tony sly and his song there's a melody in there that's very tony yeah it sounds like second act a little bit yep and 
It cranks up then to this big melodic rock song again, and then there's a big tempo change, and it has a very different tone than than you've used on the whole album. It's got almost like a, I couldn't quite place it, like maybe a Daniel Johns or some influence that I'm not quite pinpointing, but it's a very like haunting feeling. You're so beautiful when you are with me. And then again has an outro jam that, Reminds me a little bit of Frusciante. He had a side project with Joe Lally from Fugazi and Josh Klinghoffer from Plural One. And I love the way that this whole thing plays out at the end of the song. It's a satisfying conclusion. First of all, thank you. Second, as you probably noticed, there's no real chorus in this song. It's like three different acts, as you said. Or you can even yeah. say four acts. All, yeah, almost like... four with the jam at the end. Yeah, yeah. So the last act on that, my influence for that was uh, Frank Black from the Pixies. So he has yeah. this song, Los Angeles. He's also going like, uh, I want to live in Los Angeles. I want like, you know, kind of like almost punk rock. And then he kind of like breaks down to, mm, I wait. Like, yeah. like, totally like, what the fuck? So I think that's where I pulled that from. The vocals are really neat there too. They're just textural voice layers yeah, that you yeah. got. I, I tried singing different as well. Kind of like more airy. Yeah. The second part, I'm kind of going backwards. <laughs> The second part, I think, is more kind of like power pop. You yeah. know, there's a bit of Weezer there, but not. I don't think it's really Weezer. I think it's just like, like uh, '60s power pop or '70s power pop influence, like you know, kind of like Raspberries or something like that. You know, completely uh, tongue in cheek. I don't know. It's very reminiscent of melodies from the power pop era, like the. Yeah, we're gonna miss the bone. Oh, yeah, da, da, right. Da, 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 da. There's something in that where I'm like, God, I can't put my finger on it, but there's a, like, you know, some of these I'm going, yeah. ooh, that's kind of got a little bit of this on it. That's kind of got a little bit of that. A bit of Beach Boys, a bit of like the uh, Ronettes or stuff like that. Yeah. Like all that old stuff. Yeah, it is more of a classic vibe, but with the modern production, it kind of through me i was I was thinking like there's yeah. got to be a more within the last 20 years thing and maybe that's why i couldn't figure it out yeah i think i was trying to like with the production i told bob Let, let's try to make this song sound psychedelic <laughs> yeah because uh, i really got into the zombies during this time and i think i mentioned i mentioned them in pessimistic heart uh, yeah i'm ho that i'm home listening to the zombies because that's what i was doing when i wrote that song but nice. uh yeah so that album is kind of like a crossing over between like psychedelic and power pop and i can't believe i only discovered it four years ago or whenever that was but it's such a good album that yeah. zombies so i think that influence was coming through on this last song as well let me ask you this it's the kind of album that again it has a great ending on it has a great beginning it's very short so you kind of want to play it a second time when it's over were there other songs in consideration here because again with the contrast in kind of the two groups of songs if you will the sequencing has got to have been a bitch to get just right and uh <laughs> i wonder if there were other puzzle pieces that didn't fit with the up and down that you've got going the sort of push and pull yeah so in the original sequence leopard was number three pessimistic heart was number five and young forever was seven and boy with glasses was like nine Something oh yeah like that. okay so when we finished with the mixes and we sent it to Jason, Jason Livermore from the Blasting Room to yeah. master it. So, uh, you know, fresh set of years. And uh, I really uh, approve of Jason's uh, musical mind and his input. Yeah, he's and, the best. Uh, yeah, he's, he's the best. So right away, he <laughs> like, well, he, he wrote me about Boy With Glass. He's like, wow, heartbreaking. And then he wrote Young Forever Song 7. I'm not sure about that. So <laughs> like, and then... My best friend also, I sent him Young Forever, and he's like, this song needs to be in the beginning, man. It's just like one of the powerful ones. Yeah. And then Jason said that should be number three. So I kind of like worked with Jason on the sequence. I'm like, okay, good, Jason, thank you. Now where should we put Boy With Glasses? Because it's like 
if Boyle Glasses and Across the Sea are like back to back, it's like two very heavy songs at the end. Yeah. I was like, yeah. So he, he told me you should take Boy with Glasses. So we kind of, yeah, Jason saved the sequence. I love this. You've got Fat Mike, you've got Chris Rowe, you've got Jason Livermore, all of these people going, ooh, but what if this? What about that? And comes yeah. up with this great flow, again, for something very challenging because it's not like a useless record where it's like, Every song has the same two guitars and a bass, right? It's like yeah. you've got curveballs after curveballs, so how do you make that work? And it does. Yeah, because, you know, the Tommy and June album, even though it had a distinctive sound, you know, there wasn't bass on the album. There was, like, distorted keys and uh, baritone guitar. It's like, like a different story altogether, but that's kind of like what's representing the sound of the album on yeah. that one other than the acoustic songs. I, I wouldn't say that album has curveballs because it's the same sound. And then the previous album I did, the one week record, it's like acoustic and voice all the way through with some instrumentation. So with this one, I was like, okay, I made those albums already that have that like one sound kind of all the way through. Yeah. As you mentioned, also with Youth Society, because we're a band, like, you know, we're not going to put like all these cellos in, even though we did that in the past. But for but, the most yeah, part, it doesn't yeah. shake. It doesn't shake our sound. So I think this was uh, my time to kind of like... Uh, have fun at the studio because uh, I didn't come with any, uh, I didn't want to come too prepared with like my production ideas. I wanted to give Bob the production and kind of like let him lead the way this time. And Bob had done California sounds with you too, right? Yeah. But that, I don't know if you could call that a production because the guitar and vocals were recorded live for that. I oh, did two wow. takes of each song. And then he sent me the two takes of each song and I, I chose the better ones, even though on both of them, you know, Sometimes I was pitchy. Sometimes I was like, would fumble like a lyric, but that's what we got. Yeah. And then we added, we added instrumentation to that. Well, and, that's cool. Uh, the next day. So it's kind of like produced, but well, this is properly. I mean, back to your point, it simultaneously feels like you, this record all the way through, but I like that you're experimenting with those different things because they sort of, again, share qualities with some of my other favorite records that I wouldn't have thought necessarily to expect from you and so i wonder what was the reaction bringing these songs on the road how good did that feel oh amazing i mean i already got my way of playing the songs like even the like the band songs like only in the record release party we just had i played the whole album all the way through yeah but uh yeah i play like six or seven of these songs every night and uh it, it blends great with my, the rest of my stuff because it it sounds like my writing. Awesome. So uh, it works really good. Well, to uh, wrap up again, congrats on this record. Since we last Thank spoke, you. Useless ID dropped sort of the greatest hits, most useless songs. You had this great cameo filled music video where everybody's singing. I saw you guys just had your first practice in like two or three years. Are you planning to uh, head back out on the road? What's next for Useless? Yeah, we actually head back on the road and. Uh, this Friday, wow! We, we fly, fly to uh, Luxembourg, and from there to Oslo, <laughs> and like we started, yeah, we do the Scandinavian dates with Good Riddance, and then we continue with them to Europe. Awesome! So, yeah, it's like out of nowhere. Suddenly we rehearsed, but you know how it is. Like five minutes into the rehearsal, everything falls in place, and it feels like no time passed by. Like everyone, like yep, falls into his uh, part in the band. You've been playing like, together so long. During these years, we all kind of like went in different directions. Ishai's doing like a lot of solo stuff and he's busy with his bands. Corey's busy with his bands. Guy was living in Costa Rica for the most part. I, I, I was mostly doing solo. So it's like we got together and everyone like does his part for this to make it uh, happen. And uh, yeah, it sounds great. We have another rehearsal today and uh, a show tomorrow. Awesome. I'm in a similar boat where we're rehearsing for our first shows and three years and um my drummer was really reticent because even before the pandemic he kind of put us on hiatus while he had a new baby and um he hadn't really wow. played drums for real since then since 2019 and he's like i don't know if i can get ready for a show that fast and i was like dude eh. you put the three of us in a room with all our history and chemistry and it's going to be there. And so we had one practice and exactly. I was like, dude, what did I say, man? It's, it's muscle memory. And it kind of like at some point becomes like second nature. You know, yeah. I, I don't play much bass. Like if I'm doing home demos, I play bass, but so I play bass only in useless ID, but yeah, I, 
really like five minutes into the thing, I was like fucking on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, I know how to do this. It's great too. Just sometimes when you've been apart to make you really that excited to be in a room together again too, you know, and like, Oh fuck. Yeah. This feels good. Yeah, it did. I, I, the four of us had a great time rehearsing. Like we played, we re rehearsed for three hours. We played like 25 songs or something like wow. back to back, just another one, another one, another one, another one. Then, you know, that's great. Yeah, it was great. I hope we come to the States. <laughs> I know, man, we got to share the stage someday. It needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. We talked before about the book you were working on. You had sent me some some early stuff, and then last we spoke, I thought uh, it was pretty much finished. Is that something we can expect soon? So I thought it was finished. <laughs> I have the... <laughs> yeah. I know how that the goes. More, yeah, yeah, exactly. But the more time I sat on it, because, you know, I started writing this book as kind of like a biography. Yeah. I let, like, two friends from different areas of my life read a bit of it. And they both kind of came back to me with the same thing. So it made me think that I want this book to be like a lot of kind of like short stories. Okay. I, you probably call that like a memoir or uh, that it won't be like my life story because, you know, my life's not over. It's like I, I'm, I yeah. guess I'm like in the middle of it or something. And like there's a lot more to happen. So that's my thought. I don't want to close the door on making another book because I have ideas for like a possible next one already in my head. Yeah. So. So I, I just want want this to be like a collection of like 30, 35 best stories I can come up with, like the time frame that I'm referring to yeah. in my life. Yeah. And I think that's not dissimilar to, I haven't cracked it open yet, but this book from Dave Grohl, yeah. it, he took a similar approach in that it is not just one long continuous life story. It is sort of vignettes he, like that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think he can write his life story because, like, every day something crazy happens with him. <laughs> yeah, it'd be an encyclopedia you know, set. Yeah, and, like, now with the drummer passing away, uh, oh. I'm sure he can write a story, a, a book about his friendship with Taylor Hawkins. So, yeah. Yeah, so I think in a way it's, it's kind of, like, uh, similar to, to what you just said. But um, we'll see. For me, it's kind of going to be, like, more chronological order. Yeah, uh, and kind of like more tell like a a life story, but not in the biography way. Because um, I, I read some books that it was like just too much, you know, like six hundred pages of. Uh, well, I won't say who. But I was just like <laughs> get. Uh, I was just getting lost. Like by the end of it, I was like, okay, come on. <laughs> yeah, get to the good stuff. Well, thank you for coming back on. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hang out, and um, please check out this record, Young Forever. It's fantastic. You can get it on Double Helix Records. And anything else you got coming up you want to plug? Uh, there's a Tommy and June EP coming out in the summer. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that worked out as well. We have a, a handful of songs that we recorded. And what else? Have you been writing for any other bands or, or producing for any other bands like uh, you did with The Last Gang? Uh, a bit less production because just because I've been on the road and just busy with everything involved with the release of young forever and everything that went into it and like, you know, booking a tour. And so I kind of like focused my energies on that. I didn't really take any projects lately. Yeah. And, you know, now I'm going on tour. So now that we've mentioned it a couple of times, any thoughts on working with the last gang? Cause that, that wound up being my number one punk record of, of the year last year. I thought that turned out fantastic. Me too. Cause I worked with them in the very early stages. I think Brenna told you that yeah. where we were, they were sending me demos and I was sending them back like ideas and I was supposed to produce it, but I couldn't enter the U S yeah. So they took what I did. They went to Mike and Mike kept working with them and like building on that. And then they went into the studio and like, so once I got the record, I was like, Oh, I love this. This, this came out great. I wouldn't take credit as the producer. Yeah. I, I did pre-production. I did some pre-production on that album, but yeah, I think it's their best record for sure. All right, that is our show. Thank you to Yo Tom for coming back on and to Double Helix Records for reaching out to me to make this happen again. Now, I'm actually going to leave you with two songs today because I mentioned that after our last podcast together, we recorded a tribute to Tony Sly. But first, I have to leave you with a brand new song from the brand new album. This is track one on Young Forever. It's called Back to the Start. I'm looking back at my life until now. Seems like I've never begun. I've 
done it all The rise and the fall Somehow I'm not satisfied There's a new chapter that's been waiting around Feels like I'm already in it I'll keep to myself where nobody else Won't we'll know where I'm gonna be There is a place where I won't be a stranger world I'm like a traveling circus lost in a zoo some people are cruel I know I won't be like that there is a place where I won't be a stranger I gotta go right now nothing to do would happen to you Beautiful song, beautiful album. Check out Young Forever from Yotam Ben Horan. Now this next one we recorded after our last interview is on my album Stolen Songs 4, written by Tony Sly of No Use for a Name. It's one of his solo tracks, and I thought it was turning out great, but the chorus was just outside of my range. And so to bring it on home, I asked Yotam to come on and sing the part with me. This is In the End. a simple song I hope that you won't take it wrong Hello rainy day Let's see what you can wash away No more blues on a Sunday You sleep quiet in your room sake of you Listen to the howling Smell the street it's back again Fall is here and I'm so glad Nothing is permanent In the end all that we have Our memories Take this for granted Everything is growing old In the end all that we have Are memories we like to hold Let's not take this for granted Everything is growing old 